Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lincroft Bible Church. Let's all stand as we go into our time of singing to the Lord this morning in worship. Hear this from the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 to 31. It says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. No, be my life. No, I surrender. One day is better with you than all the world. Oh, spirit of life. Help me remember that it is my pleasure to say to you that all I am, my life defined, that I've been crucified with Christ, the life I live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ. grows cold when my heart grows cold and my flesh is failing the spirit is willing to point me back to you for to live is Christ and to die is better help me remember my song to you that all I am my life defined by I've been crucified with Christ. The life I live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ who lives in me. atoning his body broken for me remember his approval he gave his life to say so remember his appealing my Lord is interceding remember if you have breath to breathe it out and praise him all I am my life defined by I've been crucified with Christ the life I I live by faith through Jesus Christ who lives in me. Oh, all I am, my life defined by I've been crucified with Christ. The life I live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ.
that hope, don't we? The calm will be the better for the storms that we endure. We sing these songs and relocate ourselves in God's story as we remember that though we walk through the trials and temptations of this life, there is a glorious hope and future in Christ. We don't come together every week because it makes us feel good about ourselves or uh, to give one another sentimental platitudes, but because there is an enduring hope through the reality of Christ and his resurrection from the dead. Jesus has, in fact, promised, in this world, you will have tribulations. And some of you know that very acutely this morning as you walk through trials and difficulties in your life, some that are more than you feel you can bear. But the good news, Jesus says, is take heart. For I have overcome the world. Not only does he walk through the suffering and difficulties of this life with us, but he brings us all the way home to glory. And one day the calm will in fact be the better for the storms that we endure. Welcome to LBC this morning. We're glad to come together as the people of God to make much of Jesus and to remind one another of the steadfast hope that we have in Christ our Savior. We say here that we're transformed by the gospel. And the gospel is the good news that God saves sinners like you and me through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that through Christ God is making all things new, including you and me. And that good news makes us disciples, family, servants, and ambassadors. That's our identity as the people of God. And we celebrate and we remember that because the world is restoring us every week, trying to tell us a different truth about reality. And so we come together to hear the truth and to tell each other the truth of what God is doing in Christ. So thanks for being here this morning. If you're new or this is or newer to us, we're welcome that you're here. We're glad you're here. We want to welcome you uh, with the welcome of Jesus Christ. We hope you've grabbed a cup of coffee on your way in, uh, or at least we'll stay after to grab a cup of coffee. We'd love to get to know you. And you can introduce yourself to us in two ways. One is the normal human way by uh, introducing yourself with a handshake after service, but you could also uh, let yourself uh, be known that you are here, connect with us by filling out a connecting card in the pew back in front of you and dropping it in the giving box after the service. Uh, or you could also, uh, for those who are our members and attenders here, you can also put prayer requests on that, drop those in the giving box, and those will get prayed for uh, this very week. And so we're glad to have you with us this morning. A couple things that you need to know about, some things that are coming. It's an exciting time as we walk this Lenten journey towards Easter, and very soon we will be having the Easter egg hunt coming up this Saturday. We would have had a perfect day yesterday, so let's pray that we would get the kind of weather uh, we had this last Saturday, next Saturday. So kids, how many people are coming? Can I see uh, all the kids? Who's coming to the egg hunt? Yes, Valerie, thank you. Valerie is a, 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 an older child at heart, right? There we go. Um, and uh, so we're excited for this. Um, if this is your first time hearing about it, we want you to be there this Saturday. Uh, but here is sort of your homework, church. This is the last week. We're, we're kind of T minus six days here. And so uh, please make every effort you can to invite those you know to come to this, to this event. Uh, people aren't always willing uh, in our communities to come to a church service, but they will come to an event at a church, and there's an opportunity there to recognize that while Christians are weird, we might not be as weird uh, as they thought we were. Um, and so this is an opportunity to be able to show the, the love and kindness and generosity of Jesus. It's an opportunity for us together as a church to serve uh, the community and to, to represent Christ as ambassadors. So invite and please be praying. This is, a, this is an opportunity for us to not just love our community, but to share the good news about Jesus. And so pray for the conversations, pray for the interactions, pray that God would bring those who he wants to be here for this event. Uh, together and pray for the team that is leading that. And speaking of that team, there is a volunteer meeting uh, after the service. Anybody who's volunteering with the egg hunt, uh, make sure that you check in for that uh, meeting today. Um, also, coming up, 
is Good Friday. We'll be having a Good Friday service at 7 p.m. It's an opportunity to come together. We call Good Friday good because Christ's death uh, for us is also what gives us the opportunity to be able to be forgiven of our sins. And so we come together to celebrate Christ's death as we prepare for his resurrection. That's Good Friday, 7 p.m. And speaking of those Fridays, uh, as we have been journeying through Lent every Friday from 12 to 1, we've been having prayer gatherings that I've been leading. And so uh, just a reminder to you, we would love to have you. If you can be free during lunchtime uh, through this Lent time, a couple more Fridays, even on Good Friday, we'll be gathering together to pray as well as our Thursday evening prayer times, and those have been really encouraging to me. I've been encouraged at how many of you have been showing up for those times. And then finally, Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday uh, is the kind of Sunday where we, it's the high point of our year where we celebrate Christ's resurrection. If Christ was not raised from the dead, we would be uh, most hopeless of all people. Uh, for believing a lie, but it is no lie, and so we celebrate together Resurrection Sunday, and one way that we as a church can be prepared for that is to recognize that this is an opportunity for us to welcome those in our community, friends, family, neighbors who will be coming to church that Sunday, and so we are expecting Sunday to be quite full on Easter Sunday. We only have the one service, um, and so we need to love our neighbors well, and so this is what we're asking is that those who call LBC home and you're here all the time to make a sacrifice for one week and to sit as close to the front and as packed into the pews as we can. Uh, this is how we do it. So come early, be prepared for that. Um, and then also, in addition to sitting close, if you are able, please park as far away as you can. Uh, I'm parking down by the basketball hoops on, on the far end. So I invite you to park your car next to my luxurious vehicle uh, all the way down the end. Uh, you'll know it when you see it. <clears throat> Uh, but praise God for that. So anyway, those are the things that are going on. We want to be prepared for that time together. Um, now let's uh, transition to a time of confession of sins as we prepare our hearts again for worship. Hear this call to confession from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Almighty God, you have commanded us to rejoice always, but we are often discontent and our hearts are filled with grumbling. You have called us, O oh Lord, to be reasonable because of your nearness to us, and yet we are often quite unreasonable, angry, and violent. You have called us, O oh Lord, to not be anxious, and yet we are beset with worries and anxieties about all sorts of things. You have commanded us to bring our requests to you with a grateful heart and to bring all our requests to you, making them known to you. And yet, we refuse to pray, choosing instead to white-knuckle our way through life as if we could accomplish your ends or our goals through our own efforts. And so forgive and cleanse us, O Lord. Renew us, change our hearts through the power of the gospel and the help of your Holy Spirit. And so may your promise of peace be our experience today. Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. In Christ, there is forgiveness and reason to rejoice. So would you stand and continue to worship with us?
my soul. I will trust in Him no other. My soul is satisfied in Him. Just your voice. I rejoice. I rejoice in my Redeemer. Greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. Amen. Please turn and greet one another, especially if you have someone new sitting next to you. Show one another the love of Christ. You can make your way uh, back to your seats, please. Brian, you good? You got your bend time? Okay. I got permission from Brian to, to start now. This uh, winter and spring, since the new year, we've been going through a series. Uh, we started with a series on the Lord's Prayer to learn uh, how to pray and what to pray for. Um, but prayer is not just something we do as individuals. We wanted to show that prayer is something that we do as a people, as a church together. So we've been walking through a series called A Praying Church, uh, mostly looking at passages in the book of, of Luke. Um, and this morning, our scripture reading is from Luke chapter 5. Luke 5, beginning in verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. 
So Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he ordered him to tell no one. But go, show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. But the news about Jesus was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would teach us to pray. We ask that you would teach us to become a praying people, that you would bind us together in friendship and unity uh, over the act of prayer or through the act of prayer. I pray now um, for these words of Scripture that they would come into our lives and change us, that you would um, use these words, that we could see the, the greatness and the glory of Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen. Millennial moms have been lied to. That was the opening line of a video I saw that was posted online uh, that, that I saw this past week. And it was a mom who was kind of, I guess, exposing the lie of uh, kind of people in my generation uh, implicitly or explicitly had been told that that work, that career, can kind of give you that deepest meaning in your life, that you should throw yourself in doing, you know, whatever you're, you're passionate about um, because you'll never work a day in your life, and that's kind of the orienting, uh, orienting reality of what gives you meaning. And and this mom had, had thrown herself into that, had been building a great career, but then she started having kids and realizing that she felt guilty and the struggle of, of having being so busy um, and then just wanting time uh, with her children. Now, I'm not commenting. I don't bring that up to talk about really work-life balance or motherhood or anything like that. Um, because that's like walking through a minefield, right? Um, but no, I bring it up because I think the default word, right, of our time and place, if we were to, to ask, like, what are default responses to most people and how we're doing, we'll say busy, right? Busy. That, that we just have a lot going on. And whether you're a mom, whether you're a dad, whether you don't even have kids, whether you're not even married, everyone, we would say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy. But here's the thing. I'm, I'm going to maybe make a little contrarian point here. Um, it's not a bad thing to have a, a full life. It's not a bad thing to have a lot going on in your life. But if, here's the, here's the catch, right? If, the big IF of that, if your priorities are straight. If you have the proper priorities. I think one of the problems with having such a full life and being busy, we might say, is that it can skew our priorities and blind us to the things of God. And it can blind us to the priorities of, of Jesus and his priorities for, for our life. But I think what's so interesting, right, is that Jesus himself was pretty busy. Jesus himself was pretty busy, right? We see that in this text this morning in Luke chapter 5. So the story, there, there's a setup where this guy comes to him who has leprosy. And this was a very uh, contagious disease. This was a big deal in those days because, again, they didn't have modern medicine. There really weren't hospitals. There weren't antibiotics. There weren't these things out there. And so oftentimes, having a disease like this can find you to expulsion from the community. They didn't want it passed around, so you would be sent outside of the community. You would have been lonely. You would have been isolated. You would have been, in some cases, probably just left to die. And so this person is desperate, and they come to Jesus, and Jesus 
makes the unclean to be clean because he is the source of all cleanness and goodness. And so he heals this man and then he tells him to, to go away and the news of Jesus just explodes. You know, Jesus kind of, as we say today, goes viral and that everyone just knows about him. And so the news that says in verse 15 was spreading even farther and large crowds were gathering to him to be healed of their sicknesses. So let's, let's put ourselves in the story for a moment, right? Okay, and so what you have here is Jesus is just walking around Red Bank. He's just walking around Lincroft. He's just walking on the sidewalk. And there are a lot of people that are now coming up to him. And these large crowds, like you can look out and it's like, it's filling the parking lot of the Acme, all these people. And they're just walking towards him and coming towards him. And they're sick and they have problems. And I'm just getting anxious describing this because they're pressing in on him, right? You're like, ah, you know. He had a lot going on. Not only was he dealing with large groups of people, But, I mean, these were people with problems, right? How exhausting is that? Have you ever had to deal with people with problems before? It's not easy. And this is the life that Jesus had. And so they were coming to him to be healed. And oftentimes, we read in other passages that Jesus was doing the healing, right? So he was meeting needs. He was talking to people. He was rebuilding their lives. And often he was doing this from morning until evening. Evening, Jesus had a lot going on in his life. And yet, it says in verse 16, this is so key here, it says in verse 16, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And so what this is showing us is that Jesus made prayer a priority. Even the priority in his life. Because the language that's being used here is it's giving this impression that this was Jesus' habit. He would often slip away to pray. He would do this time after time again. We see all throughout the book of Luke, that Jesus makes this his habit. In Luke chapter 3, for example, it says, Now it happened while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word, oh, this is 5. I need the uh, prayer. Yeah, there we go. Luke, thank, thank you, Rebecca. Appreciate that. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized, and while he was praying... The heaven was opened. Next verse, please. It was at this time that Jesus went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Next. It happened that while he was praying alone, his disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do people say that I am? Some eight days after these sayings, Jesus took along Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, his appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples came and said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. In Luke 23, Jesus was saying, now this is him on the cross. It says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, and they cast lots, dividing up his garments among them. And furthermore, on the cross, he prays, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Jesus made prayer a priority in his life. He regularly would get away. He spent a whole night in prayer on a mountain. 
Before he chose his disciples, he spent significant time in prayer. While he was being baptized, he was praying. He was praying so much that it was a magnetic example to his disciples that they wanted to learn how to pray, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And then in Jesus' greatest moment of need, where he is on the cross and he is dying, Jesus is praying. Jesus prioritized prayer. He made it a habit, and the, the language also is giving this sense of, right, he's surrounded by people, he's meeting needs, he has a very full life, but he's looking for the opportunities to slip away and pray. As one author wrote, Jesus was the most dependent person in history. Jesus, even though he was fully God, 100% God and 100% human, even though Jesus had the power to snap his fingers and miraculously heal all the needs at one time, yet Jesus humbled himself in perfect and total dependence upon the Father at all times. He's presenting the paradigm and the model for what a genuinely human life is to look like, which is complete dependence on his father and so he slips away and he goes out into the deserted places and he prays so i think this raises the the question for us right where does prayer fall on your list of priorities where does prayer fall on your list of priorities is it a line uh, uh, is your life and if we did like a, a time audit of your life does your priorities and, and how often you're praying, is that aligning with Jesus and his priorities? Where is prayer placed in your life? I think if we allow this text, not, not only that we read this text, but we allow this text to read us, and we put ourselves in this text, we'll see some of the reasons why we don't uh, prioritize prayer, why we don't pray like Jesus does. And look again at verse 15 and 16. Let's live in this story. The news about Jesus was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him, to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And so living in this story, I think, let's say, uh, let's just put ourselves in Jesus' shoes for a minute, right? Like if you were in Jesus' shoes, what would you do? Well, one of the reasons why I think we don't pray is because many of us have a Messiah complex. Now, that was okay for Jesus to have because he was actually the Messiah, right? But for us, we have a Messiah complex, meaning we need to meet all the needs. We need to fix all the problems. We need to do this ourselves, right? When you are faced with overwhelming circumstances, when you are faced with a lot of problems in your life, when you are faced with people who come to you with issues, what is your default response? For many of us, it's to roll up our sleeves and think, I'm just going to try harder and do better and stack my schedule. Some of us, if we were in Jesus's shoes, we would be out morning until evening healing people we would heal until every last single person was healed and then we would collapse in exhaustion right the default is we think that everything depends on us and so we have this messiah complex thinking that if i'm not if it's to be then it's up to me but that's not true And so this drives us away from prayer because, you know, on the outset, uh, on, the, on the surface of it, right, like prayer doesn't seem to be that productive. You're not doing anything. You're just sitting there, sometimes not even talking out loud, right? So on the surface of it, it doesn't seem like you're, anything productive is happening or that anything is going to be fixed, and so why bother praying because I can do this tangible thing. I can make this phone call or I can go to this place or I can type this email. Ugh. And um, that's a tangible thing that I can do and I can control it and maybe things will get better that way. And so instead of dropping to our knees and folded hands in prayer, 
we instead stand up, roll up our sleeves, and we get busy. And we forget the Lord. On the other hand, though, maybe for some of you it's, it's not a Messiah complex that keeps you from prayer, but it's just quitting that keeps you from prayer. So like you're in this situation, right? Again, imagine that you're in Jesus' shoes and there's all this crushing uh, you know, crowd of people coming towards you and you just see it and, and maybe like you heal one person and two people and then you're like, all right, I'm done, right? My bandwidth is exhausted. And so you just quit. And you're like, the need is too overwhelming. There's too much. I can't cope. I can't do it. So I am just out of here. And you run away and you quit. But quitting is different than praying, right? Quitting is just saying, I can't deal with this. I need to escape. And oftentimes it also amounts to running to some kind of other way to cope, whether it's a substance, whether it's a device, whether it's a relationship, I don't know, but you're just using something to cope with the crushing demands and obligations and issues that are coming in your life. Maybe it's drinking too much. You know, maybe it's some other kind of substance. Maybe it's just wanting to, to zone out and not think about anything. Uh, but whatever it is, your thing to cope, and that's a form of quitting, right? But the problem that both the Messiah complex and quitting have, the problem with both of these things is that really at root, they're all about self-sufficiency and self-effort. You're believing that life is up to you. And the Messiah complex says, well, I can accomplish it. I'm just going to dig in and try harder and do more, and I will scale the mountain. The other side of it sees the need and says, well, I'm going to try, but I can't. I'm going to fail, and so I'm going to run away. Both of those are, are, are essentially, we're saying, life is all about us. And I think what motivates so much of that is this underlying anxiety that we have that we're actually alone in the universe. It's a question of faith. It's a question of faith. Like, do we really believe and do you really believe that there is a benevolent God that exists and he loves you? Or is the universe really just a cold, empty place eventually destined to heat death or when the robots take over? And if that's the case, then it's all on us. It's a question of faith and trust. Are we willing to trust God? And see, really like the biggest issue isn't even prayer so much it, itself. Jesus actually exposes what the biggest issue is in his own prayer life for us. If I could have uh, Luke twenty three forty six back on the screen. Jesus is praying right when he's on the cross and he's crying out with a loud voice saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. See, what Jesus is identifying here is really the core issue, the root issue of our prayerlessness, which is our own sin. It's our own sin and selfishness. And so Jesus is saying, look, like, yes, you are meant to live in complete dependence with God. God created us. In Genesis chapter 1, at the very beginning of the Bible, God created humanity in his image, which means we were meant to reflect him, we were meant to be in relationship with him, we were meant to love him with everything that we have. That's how God designed life. But we have all turned our own way and we said, this life that I have with God, actually something out there is, is I, we think it's better. So we're going to go towards that. And the Bible calls this death. We're turning from the source of life and we're choosing death. We're choosing these things which can never satisfy. We're choosing to disobey God. We're choosing to go our own way. And the Bible calls that sin. And so this creates a predicament because we're meant to be with God. We're meant to exist with God. But God is a holy and righteous judge. He cannot allow sin to be in his presence. And so he says, you will be judged for that. Because we've rebelled against the infinitely perfect king, right? It's not just or good for good rulers to allow evil in their kingdoms. 
And so Jesus, or, or God, w- uh, was going to destroy evil. Right? We see this exemplified in many different ways in the Bible. One of them is Noah's Ark, Noah's Flood. That's why God brought the flood. He wiped out almost every single person. That can seem incredibly cruel unless we understand the nature of God, that he is holy, righteous, and good. And we're not that. But God says, you know what? I love you, and I'm not just going to leave the world this watery tomb in the flood, but I want you to come home to me, and I want to make a way, and that's why Jesus came so that he could live that life that we have failed to live in complete devotion and dependence and love for God. Jesus did that. In a sense, we were to always be in prayer, right? In complete dependence on God. But we can't and we don't because of these things I've talked about today. And so Jesus says, I will do that for you. I will be persistent in prayer. I will be dependent in complete, completely dependent on the Lord. And then he goes all the way to the cross and he's praying on the cross. He's praying for us. Right? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, into your hands I'm committing my spirit. I'm trusting you, God, that this sacrifice, that this payment for sin will be sufficient enough and will save my people. And so that's really the root issue is our own sin and self-sufficiency. We believe in self-centeredness. We think that we can go life on our own, and so we don't pray, but Jesus has taken on our sin, taken on the punishment we deserve, so that we can be freed to pray. We can be freed to pray. And we see that this pattern and example is actually picked up by Jesus' followers because when you believe in him, God sends you his Holy Spirit, his empowering presence in your life. And we see that now that his disciples trust in him, they are given the ability to be a praying people. And that's demonstrated in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, essentially, I am going away, but I'm going to send you the Spirit. And it says in Acts chapter 1, It says they returned from Jerusalem from a mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were saying that is Peter and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James and Simon and and Judas, son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. That's a praying church. That's a a people that have come and they've now found life in Jesus. They're not trying to handle life on their own. They're not trying to handle life by themselves. But this is a people that has come and they have found life in Jesus And they're bound together in prayer. And so he is our only hope. To be faithful in prayer means having faith in our faithful Savior who prayed for us all the way to the cross to deal with our sin and to bring us home to him. So we can now be faithful in prayer. I love how these verses describe what faithful prayer looks like. He says that they were all with One mind, with one mind. So being faithful in prayer means Christian unity and brotherhood and sisterhood. That's why we come together on Thursday evenings for prayer meeting. That's why we've wanted to make space on Friday during lunch for prayer time. That's why we meet together in community groups and we have prayer as a time so that we could be of one mind. Many of you know the famous Bible verse, right? Where two or three are gathered together. Jesus says, I am there with you. But what we also don't often realize is in that same passage, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound, and whatever you loose will be loosed. I don't fully understand what that means, but what I do know is it indicates the power of agreeing together in prayer. I know that it indicates that there's a power of being one mind together in prayer. And these disciples we're making it a continual habit of just being together. 
And I think we miss the import of these verses as well because it lists off these disciples like Andrew and Bartholomew and all these guys that they were with Jesus, right? They were with Jesus for three years. They're the original disciples. They kind of, in a sense, they have the power, the responsibility to take the gospel out there. And they're just in prayer meeting together with everybody. There's really no hierarchy in prayer, right? It says that they were devoting themselves with prayer and kind of a, a line that's easy to glance over when you're reading the text, but it's absolutely countercultural for that time and place. It says, and along with the women, along with the women, because in those days when you would go to the temple, the Jewish temple to pray, the women were often separated and they're in a different area of the temple together. But now we are the temple. And so the Holy Spirit indwells all of us, male and female. And you just have these disciples, right? They've been with Jesus from the beginning, and they're just hanging out in prayer meeting with everybody else because they're all coming together to pray. So it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, what your station in life is. There's always an open chair for you at prayer meeting. We need to be praying together. And they were faithful and prayer. And these were disciples that had embraced the sacrifice of Jesus. And then Jesus was knitting them together in oneness and in prayer. So, a couple final reflections here. How to pray together. How do we become faithful in prayer together? I'm going to go from the less intense version to the more intense version. Less intense come to prayer meeting, right? Make space for prayer in your life. Um, Thursday evenings, we get together for prayer. Friday at lunchtime, we get together with prayer. Maybe those times don't work for you. That's okay. If you're in Bible study here and you're praying together, that counts, right? If you're in community group, maybe spend a significant portion of your time in prayer together there, that counts as well. Maybe for some of you, again, these things, these times, it's just like, uh, it's hectic and it's crazy. Find a prayer partner. Find someone in the Lord that you can just call, that you can FaceTime, that you can get on the phone when you're commuting or whatever and pray together, make it a point and a habit to be in continual and habitual prayer with one another. Now, if you don't have anyone like that, that's what Sundays are for. Church does not end when we let out of, when these doors open and we give the benediction. Church it continues and extends into the coffee time. It extends into the time that we're just here together. That's why we do these things, so we can get to know one another, we can hear your story, and we can make connections. And that's what we want. So maybe you'll find someone there that's being faithful in prayer together. Now, this other suggestion, it's a little bit um, more focused on you as an individual, but I think it's important. And I want to challenge you on this. Truly consider this. Take a day off from work and pray. Take a day off from work and pray. Many jobs, not all of them, but many, you have sick leave, you have personal days. Take a day. Just take a day in the middle of the week. And I think that's an important signaler I think it's important signaler because what it says is I don't need to do anything productive and yet I'm still loved. I don't need to control the world because ultimately God is in control of the world. I do think that in this time and in this place there is quite the idol of work and being on that treadmill that strangles our soul and we can't even conceive of taking a day off in the middle of the week away from work. But I would just encourage you, put a stake in the ground, push back against that, and devote yourself to a day of prayer. Now, this day is not going to look like you're just in a trance-like state with this pure communion with the Lord. That's not how prayer works. That's not what it's going to be like. What it will probably be like is it might feel fairly underwhelming at times. But this is what I would do, right? 
Drop the kids off at school. If you have kids, drop them off at school. They're taken care of. Go to a coffee shop, get a piece of paper out, and just start writing down your thoughts and offer them before the Lord. Write those things down. Offer them up as a prayer. Clear your mind. Maybe do that for like 30 minutes, and then open your Bible and read your favorite Bible passage. Psalm 23, John chapter 3. I don't know, just start reading Scripture And then as you're reading, start jotting down your thoughts in prayer to the Lord. Stay at this coffee shop, I don't know, maybe for like an hour or two. Then go get some lunch somewhere else so you don't look weird because you're there for hours. (laughs) Get some lunch. Maybe if it's a nice day, you go to a park and you just walk and just look at God's creation and worship him and pray and wrap it up by 2 o'clock. Wrap it up by 2 o'clock. Now look, I understand right, that there are so many different scenarios, so many different situations, so don't get bogged down in my specific details. I hope you can hear my heart, though. Maybe it's not during the week, maybe it's a weekend, but it's carving out time to spend in prayer. And the point is to signal to yourself that you are the type of person that makes prayer a priority. Because the people of God or people that are in together, that, that are in prayer. And if you want to take things even further, if you want to take things even further, maybe you even grab another good friend and both of you get away for times of prayer, right? That's like the most intense version, right? Um, but again, Jesus's priorities was to depend on his father. And he is our paradigm and he is in our our example when we look to him though inevitably we will say i can never get there and that's true because we're not jesus but that's precisely why jesus came to die for when we fall short from the glory of god jesus has paid for our sins jesus has reconciled us to the father if we will believe in him and then jesus has now said now that you are in me Now that you are connected to me through faith, I will give you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit begins this renovation project in your life where this prayer priority slowly starts inching up the list and other things start getting pushed down the list because we begin to be changed and transformed and we begin to recognize what I need most is my Father because he loves you. You are not alone in this world. The passage that Dan talked about a couple of weeks ago, I want to end with this. It says, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. Will he not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Holy Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. God delights to hear you. He loves it when you pray. And he's hearing you because of what Jesus has done for us to open the way. Let's come before him in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we look to Jesus as our model. Lord, we look to Jesus uh, and we see that he just wanted to be with you. So I pray that you would stir that desire in our heart, that we would push against um, some of the the busy things that just crowd out uh, time for prayer, um, and that we would devote ourselves to that. Lord, we recognize that we are weak and frail uh, people, not perfect, and so we need your forgiveness, we need your cleansing, um, and we need your Holy Spirit to move in our lives, to change us, and to conform us to the image of Christ. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. That God has given us, besides the gift of prayer, is the gift of communion. The gift of communion, the sacred symbol, the sacred practice that we have together. If those who are serving communion can please come forward this morning. Communion is given uh, as a gift to us to help us remember the truth of the gospel. 
It is a practice that looks back on what Jesus has done for us on the cross. The broken bread represents Jesus' broken body. And the fruit of the vine in the cup represents Jesus' spilled blood. That's why he came. He was born to die. And he was born to bring forgiveness. But communion is also a gift that's given to us in the present, in the here and the now. And it's a real communing with Jesus even now through our faith, through trust, through this bond that we have in the Holy Spirit. And so we're able to partake in communion with Christ through this practice as we believe the gospel and we trust in him. But it's also a communing with one another in the family of God. This communion is a family meal for those that have professed their faith in Jesus. And so even if, uh, if you're visiting and you go to another church, we would still invite you to come and partake in communion together because we are bound together in that unity through the gospel. But if you have not placed your trust in Jesus yet as your Savior, we would ask that you would please refrain from partaking in these elements. Uh, the Bible describes this as a family meal for believers, and so we would ask that you would just please refrain from that. But as uh, those that are, are partaking are passing by, uh, maybe this is an opportunity for you to take Christ for the very first time, to trust in his broken body and his shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins and to be made right with our Heavenly Father. And so if that's something that you uh, will do today, that you will see the need for Christ and confess that need uh, to him, uh, I would love to talk with you after, and we can prepare you to take communion with us the very next time that we partake uh, together. Uh, but communion is also uh, forward-looking. It is a foretaste of the great banquet the great joy that we will have when Jesus returns and calls us home to himself. And so we can celebrate this. Yes, we can examine our lives, and the Bible tells us to do that. And we can offer uh, prayers of asking for forgiveness to the Lord in this time. Yes, we do that self-examination. But communion is not a time for just morbid in introspection and to feel bad about ourselves. But uh, if you are feeling heavy with your sin, uh, this meal is precisely what you need because it reminds us of the payment that Jesus has purchased for us for our sins. And so it is a meal that we partake in joy and we know one day we will be with Jesus and our faith will be turned to sight. So we will distribute these elements. Uh, those are serving you can partake. I will pray over these things. A couple of notes here. Uh, please uh, leave the left side of your pews. We'll have servers here, 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 and here. So please leave the left side of your pew, take your element, circle back up your row, and then you can be seated. Once all the elements are distributed, we will partake together as a family. If you're unable to walk down and get your elements, um, you know, always feel free. You can ask someone maybe next to you to come and get some elements, or you could raise a hand and ushers just be looking out. Anyone just raise a hand and they will get you some elements over to you if you're unable to, to make it down. But with that, let me pray and we will partake together. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for a sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that he is not still in the grave and that we can have real communion with him now and, Lord, real joy with him. So I pray, Lord, if there's any that are just downtrodden and discouraged because of their sin, may you lift up their souls with joy knowing that they are forgiven. If there are those that are suffering intensely, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, that you by your spirit would bring them great peace, that they will know that you are a good father and you are with them. Lord, may we celebrate this in joy together. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ's body broken for you.
Hear this from 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul writes, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we have proclaimed your death here today. It is where we find life. It is where we find forgiveness. It is where we find connection with you and with our brothers and sisters. I thank you for this church family. I thank you for this church body. I pray, Lord, that you would grow us into an increasingly more dependent church, dependent on you, dependent on your spirit, and dependent in prayer. We thank you for the gift of prayer and being able to pour out our souls before you, and we, we thank you that you hear us when we pray. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Let's all stand together. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and
service with a benediction from the word. Hear this from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Go in peace. You are sent.